Rolling. Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, this is Matt Eske, uh, director of the Mojo Manifesto, and this is by uh, my buddy Mojo Nixon. Wait, aren't you supposed to do this at some point? Come on now. Wait. No. Are you on that anymore? No. Sound, everything's synced? Everything's synced. Are you on a separate recorder? It's all one deal. Um, so I've, I've got to ask, uh, Mojo, why'd you let this guy start <laughs> filming you? What the hell was going on? You know, originally I had a big, uh, I had a whole bunch of tapes. I had a, I had a, two huge boxes of videotapes of me and Skid and me and the Toad Lickers on every kind of, you know, local TV show, public access shows. They were just starting in the 80s when we did. And uh, he, he shows up at my house with a camera he bought, or so somebody bought for him for, was that thing like $10,000? It was like 5000 Yeah. He, he didn't know anything about lights or camera. He didn't, the camera was still in the box. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to film you, and I'm going to film all our friends, all the Mojo acolytes, and we're going to make a documentary. And, that's, and I said, fine. And I, and I said, look, uh, you know, you do whatever you want. I, I got three requests, you know, make it, you know, make it funny, make it so that the fans will like it. Right. So if you're a real Mojo fan, you walk out of there going, shit, man, that was good. And uh, or and, and, you know, don't make it too long. You know, hey, my fa one of my favorite movies is the uh, Wolfman from 1941. It's thir it's uh, well, it's not even 87 minutes. It's like uh, 77 minutes. That's, that's, about, that's about a good length. So I've got to ask, time-wise, this is 2011, 2012. Um, speed us up to 2019 when you kind of take this into another level and you actually start molding this in and, and folding it in. Because other than that, I mean, there's a lot of time. You're getting a lot of footage. Right. When did you compile this and figure this out yes. and get it to the length where he wasn't going to be upset as too long. Right, right. So yeah, so I started filming in 2012, got the idea in 2011. And then, um, yeah, for, for the years after that, I kept doing interviews and, and acquiring like uh, footage from people, um, you know, archival stuff. And then uh, I kind of shelved it for a couple of years because I just didn't have time to get into editing it. And I, I didn't feel five, like five years, really yeah. five years. I, I didn't feel like I could hand it over to anybody to edit because it's such a weird story and it would be hard, almost too hard to explain to yeah. an editor how to do it. I tried to I tried to like, I said, I got money. We'll, we'll hire we'll hire Robert Gordon from Memphis to somebody like that to edit it. Like, I no, just he didn't, do it. Yeah, it just didn't seem like I could I could do it that way. Like I needed to do it myself. So I waited until I had a window of time to do it. So that was 2019, and I just took a year and no, learned. No, you're, you're not you're mis leaving out the best part. What's the best part? He goes online and Google's how do you edit a movie? Yeah. Well, and I did it, start at the beginning. Yes. yes. He, I, said, and I he, did. See, he goes online and it's how do you Google a movie? I mean, how do you edit a movie on Google? And then it says you know there's all these programs you can use and you know Apple's got a whole thing and then right you yeah so I ended up using Adobe Premiere, you know, I was like, what's the best software to use and all this stuff. And, you know, I worked as a graphic designer, so I had some basis in like how to use computer design programs. But uh, so I ended up using Premiere and I just learned Premiere with YouTube videos, you know, and uh, and started that way. And it took me a year to learn how to edit and to edit um, the movie and uh, worked great, though. You know, I'm curious then, knowing that it's, you know, basis in, in your band. Could you have allowed someone in to do what he was doing? Like, it, would it have been weird if you had a film crew with you, or would you have been okay with that? Well, I might have thought, you know, I, I didn't interfere at all with what no. he did. Uh, because I, we were in the van together for 10 years. You know, we know more about each other than our wives or ex-wives know. You know, so, right. So I trusted him completely to capture the mojosity, the essence of mojo. And right, so it had it been somebody, had I hired somebody, I would have... I would have been tempted to go, well, let me see the cut. Mm -hmm. Right. But I didn't I I literally didn't see anything. I what I said was we're I work at uh, Sirius XM on Outlaw Country, and uh, we did a cruise, and, I, and they, they wanted to show part of the movie on a cruise. I told him he couldn't go on the cruise until he had a 20-minute reel. Well, he, he had like a fucking 40-minute reel, and it was really good. People were like, you know, hey, this, this, is, this is like, because the expectations are it's a Mojo Nixon documenting, it's going to be all fucked up. And it's directed by his his bass player. Well, this is going to be dumber than a box of hot rocks. But no, people you know people liked it. You know people people even who even just saw the forty minute version. Uh, there were people on the on the on the cruise crying after seeing it. I'm, I'm like, man, this this is out of control. <laughs> 
how much footage did you have to go through? I mean, because there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mojo's been messing around for decades now. Now, we kind of got lucky because, you know, he came up in the 80s. You know, he got popular in the 80s when people had video cameras, you know? So there was a lot of stuff. And he was, like, at that level of popularity that people were actually filming him. So there was a lot of old stuff, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had tons of stuff to go through. And, and part of the thing is, yeah, I mean, they put that on me because I was procrastinating. It was such a huge job. It's hard to wrap your head around it. I think it happens to a lot of mov people trying to make movies, which is the job is too big to finish it. Mm -hmm. Like you can't wrap your head around it. And so them telling me I had to do 20 minutes <laughs> was really probably why it got made because I was sort of forced to do, you know, it's just like anything in life. You just do a little piece of it. You have to go step by step and it's, it's hard to wrap your head around the whole thing. So, um, yeah, but I had like a ton of stuff to go yeah. through, and eventually we, I went through it all. And it's I probably used like two percent of what yeah, I had because we, we made videos. You know, there's there's all the videos. I mean, I did the MTV spots. There's lots of live stuff. There is just you know, and I and luckily back in the in the eighties when we were touring, I would say they said you want to be on local cable access, so I'd say sure, but send me a tape. And they so yeah. I had a, I literally had two huge boxes full of tapes. Yeah, that's a big thing. You had a man got a format all of that and change yeah, yeah, it put it all yeah in i did machine. a lot of conversion stuff and you know a lot of the old beta tapes and weird sources but and, yeah it's no big deal and then there was other stuff like online there was tons of things on you know people just had youtube you know mojo in you know san francisco you know july 87 you know and i did it over such a long period of time that i was able to sort of chase people down for footage over such a long period. It's not like I tried to do the whole thing in a year. So like in 2015, I came across a huge amount of footage that I, that I didn't even know existed. Um, so if I had done it real fast, I, it would have been a different movie, but it was really good that it happened over 10 years. Yeah, there was only one thing that I wished was in the, that we had the tape. It's me and Dr. John playing a song on live on MTV at Mardi Gras. Wow. I found, there's a picture of it in Us Magazine that my mom had, I found it, but that I can't find the tape anywhere, but that the every and that's another thing. When you do watch the movie, it is there was a lot of mojo shit in there. It is very dense, you know. It's like man, there's a there's a whole mojo's life was really exciting. There's a whole lot going on. <laughs> Do you not think your life was exciting? It, you know, it wasn't that exciting. I, I do think my life was exciting. And I do think, you know, and, 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 and I, uh, I truly believe that in hindsight, I really, I over, you know, performed. I shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have been as big or as famous as I was. But what I, I'm a bullshit artist. My, my art is not in the singing and the songwriting. My art is in telling the story and, you know, and being completely full of shit. I'm an entertainer, right? I'm an entertainer. I'm not, I'm not a musician. And so, yeah, I think that's all captured in the movie. He's a pretty good guitarist, though. I wouldn't yeah, say he's he a terrible became, musician. He became a great guitarist. It's pretty weird. Yeah, don't, don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of, of stories and, and mojo magic, um, Pete kind of alluded, I think it was Pete, uh, alluded to the Don Henley actually stepping on stage with you back in, what is it, must have been like 92. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. 92, yeah. yeah can at you? The, at the Hole in the Wall in Austin. In Austin, yeah. Right across the street from uh, University of Texas. And uh, it was unbelievable. It's a tiny place. You know, and the Hole in the Wall kind of had two rooms. There's a front room and a back room. There's only 50, maybe 100 people in the front 100 room. 100 at most, yeah. At most. And uh, un unfortunately, there's no pictures or videos of it. Somebody drew a cartoon of it in the Austin Chronicle once. But yeah, Don Henley, Don Henley got on stage and sang Don Henley Must Die with us. And that was the one time in my life I was flabbergasted. I was literally, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I was like Ralph Cramden. And I said something like, well, uh, you know, do you want to, you know, you want to argue, you want to debate, you want to fist fight? He goes, I want to sing the song, especially the part about not getting, because he goes, Don Henley must die. Don't let him get back together with Glenn Fry. And at the time they had tried to reunite and Irving Azoff, their manager had like said, I'll give you each a million. And they both came out of the rehearsal saying, that motherfucker's not worth a million. I ate his guts. I want to kill him. You know, then uh, later, I don't know, a couple of years later, it's 10 million. And everybody, every, 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 it was all smoothed over. Just yeah. added out of zero. Yeah. Um, speaking of Austin, um, what does the Continental Club mean to you guys? And the amount of shows you guys have done there, I feel like 
there's life to everything in that just from y'all's experience there what what is what does that mean to you what does austin mean to you we, we, just your feelings about that place in particular because obviously san diego is important and there are other parts of the country but austin really loves mojo nixon yeah, I mean, it's where he got the band in the first place. I and mean, the band was based in Austin, and he was looking for a backing band, and that's where... The Toad Lickers. The Toad Lickers. That's where the band lived. So that was kind of the beginning of that, right? You were friends with Joe Ely. And, uh, and, and I was... Uh, Steve, the guy that runs the Continental Club, is our buddy. Yeah. So he's been a Mojo supporter from the get-go. Uh, he married a friend of ours from San Diego. There's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of crossbreeding and and and, and we right and uh, and so yeah the Continental Club and playing you know for the last 20 years we've been playing this uh, party in South by Southwest uh, you know and before that we played eight million gigs there. And it's really in that the, the Continental Club and Steve Wertheimer is the the center of the roots scene in Austin that we were a part of, and so which yeah. kind of connects to the the roots scene in Southern California. You know, that's that's kind of those two kind of connect a little right. bit, and with New Orleans right. a little bit. You know, there's only certain places where that stuff is really happening. So. Yeah, you know, right. Dave Alvin and Dale Watson, you know, come together at the Continental Club, and it was uh, it was a great it was a great place for us to play. And they made a real mistake. They stopped charging me for booze. <laughs> <laughs> What was this? Like the mid nineties? What was no, They stopped charging me, and uh, things got out of hand. I, they, I had to make them start charging me again, because otherwise things get out of hand. <laughs> you brought up South by. What did having the film at South by? This must have been just one of the best parties ever. I mean, what did that mean to you guys getting it into there? I think originally you were plotting for it to be like a short way back in the day for South by. Was that in initial yeah. plans? Yeah, the year of COVID. It was supposed yeah, to be yeah. COVID year. It was supposed to come 2020. So yeah. Yeah, COVID happened right before it was going to premiere at South by Southwest 2020, I guess. Mm. And so then it didn't end up premiering until 2022, which turned out to be okay because I did find a little bit of extra footage in that two years that I added. So I was okay with it because now it feels like I got everything, you know. But um, Wait, the, the footage is Winona Ryder saying oh, play, MTV footage. Yeah, playing well, the Winona footage. Yeah, yeah that, that's the stuff I couldn't find. That was a uh, uh, MTV wouldn't play the Debbie Gibson video, but they did. They did send Kurt Loder down there to do an interview about the making of the video, and I couldn't find it. We talked about it in the movie, but I didn't have it. It was the one thing I didn't have. You know, almost yeah. everything else I've got the the proof of it. You know, and that was the one thing I didn't have, and I found it in that two years. So yeah, and Winona says it's the greatest role of her life playing Debbie Gibson. <laughs> yeah, she's so effusive. I mean, I couldn't even believe what she was saying, really, when I finally saw it. You know, it's such a cool scene because she's in the, the dress. Right. Right. It oh, is yeah. so awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, me and, and me and her had been in that movie, Great Balls of Fire. Yeah. That uh, and where I played the drummer, and uh, John Doe was in that movie, and Jimmy Vaughn and Dennis Quaid played uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. That's how I knew her. That's how we. Y'all got to hang out with the, the Lewis family as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy and scary. <laughs> you know, they, the Faraday fireballs are all completely nut jobs. Linda Gale's still around. She still plays. Yeah, when we made Great Balls of Fire, uh, Linda Gale like played in the, the office of maybe Memphis Magazine, and me and John Doe went, and it, it, was, it was like a hurricane. She was like a her. She's in a very small room playing the piano, and it fucking it scared me. It scared Mojo. <laughs> to scare Mojo, I can't believe it. Um, Y'all have played so many. I have an instrument question. Y'all had so many different instruments with all the different players you've had. What is the? I, I think I know what this answer is. But what's the funkiest thing you've had to sing off of musically? Uh, meaning what? I mean, we, just. Where you were like, this is crazy what we're doing. This is the type of music we're putting out there. Like you guys have switched up the genre. You've 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 added country tunes. You've 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 added different instruments that other people haven't used in the genre. I mean, you guys have always kind of reinvented almost every decade. It well, feels like making that album with Jello. We, you know, we made a, a, an album with Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys. That was a uh, that, that was taxing. 
that was because uh, you know he was used to being in charge and I was used to being in charge and it was you know me and Jello were friends but man that was he, we we just we didn't work the same way you know uh, Jello thought making a record was kind of like an erector set you put move pieces around I thought making a record is about the moment of creation. Uh, I thought it was more like a piece of clay and you get the moment of creation and if you get a good moment of creation then you can add to it but what do you like about the toad lickers <laughs> uh, it's loud it's fast it's stupid there's not many people you know when we started out we loved uh, NRBQ and Joe Ely and the blasters and there's not many people playing straight ahead three chord rock and roll anymore Right, and uh, now we're the grizzled veterans who can play, you know, Chuck Berry, right, uh, Rock Pile, Nick Lowe and Dave Edmonds. Those are the guys that we loved and uh, we, you know, we aspire to be them. We're, we're never gonna be as great as Chuck Berry, but you know, you're drunk, you're in a bar, it's Friday night, uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. Huh? Get a little clip. We want you to yell louder into the mic. Yes. <laughs> There's no way that's not showing up. Yeah. You're talking loud enough, I think. You think so? <laughs> um, I'm, I've got to ask, um, as far as, like, what's next for Mojo? You've never given up this 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 moniker. I'm curious, what is the ne what 10 years from now, what's Mojo doing? Well, Mojo's dead 10 years from now. Here's what happens. The movie comes out, it gets on Netflix or Amazon, it gets a little traction, gets a little traction, and there's somebody says, hey, we gotta put Mojo on tour. You know, there'll be, there'll be an offer, hey, you know, here's some money, we all play 10 shows. So us and the Toad Liquors will go out, and I'll die on a Tuesday night in Des Moines, Iowa, and I'll be I'll be in a in a motel room uh, with a couple with a couple of hookers, and I think I'm snorting cocaine, but it's really borax, and that's when Mojo dies. <laughs> I want to ask other questions about that, but I, I won't. Um, I, I've got to ask though, as far as the fan base, knowing that the fans have stuck with you for so long, Mojo fans are insane as much as you are. Like they love you, they love all the guys around you. What is the fan base meant to you over this time? No, I think I've always said this. You know, I'm not really famous. I'm almost famous. Uh, people that like me really like me. And people who don't know about me are just like, why is the fat hillbilly yelling motherfucker so much? You know, what, 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 think he's Richard Pryor? What's going on here? Right, so right, people that like Mojo really like Mojo. And I think, and that was one of the ideas to me about the movie, we should reward them. We should give them the full, th right. They shouldn't walk away going, oh, Mojo's gone soft. They should walk away going, whoa! <laughs> Obviously, the world's gotten kind of PC. Do you think Mojo could have been created right now in this weird world of you can't say this, you can't say that? You know, that's one of the reasons I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Facebook because uh, I have this job, you know, this job that pays it serious. And I'm sure I would say I, my talent is saying something uh, uh, too quick and too, and, you know, and too much. I want to go too far too soon. And uh, if we uh, on the way up here, we're listening to Chris Rock yesterday uh, from whatever year that was, 96 or 98. You can't even do that anymore. Right. What Chris Rock was saying and the way he was, you know, attacking all kinds of sacred cows, you, you know, very few people can get away with it. So, no. Uh, I, but I think it'll it'll go. It'll the, there's always going to be somebody who says you you say I can't say that. Fuck you. I'm going to say it. Right. And sometimes it'll be up front and sometimes it'll go back. But the voices of George Carlin and Richard Pryor and Chris Rock will, you know, they'll come back around again. Right. Because uh, there's always there's always going to be pretentious, self-satisfied, self-satisfied motherfuckers who need to be knocked down a notch. Somebody, you know, two weeks of TV of the Queen of England. Fuck the Queen. What did the Queen ever do? The Queen can lick my hairy ball sack. She was oh she was born. She was, oh she was born. Did she cure cancer? Did she end racism? How about childhood poverty? Fuck the Queen. Uh, anyway, I, I, I'll. I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Matt, is there anything you couldn't play? Anything you didn't want to show? Uh, couldn't. Anything I couldn't use. Uh, 
I mean, I can't tell a complete story, you know. I mean, th there's some stuff left out, I guess, you know. But I, I don't feel like I that I had to like pull stuff out of there to not offend people or anything. No, we want to offend people. Yeah. We. Yeah. That's part. That's part of my job. <laughs> What's it like seeing like your family and seeing the people that have known you your whole life before you became Mojo? When you seen the film, what what were your feelings of that? Seeing the people you love and know. Well, it, my brother is a little upset. He's not in it. <laughs> my sister and my mother and my father are in it, but he's not in it. He he goes. My brother's review was that's pretty good. Said where the hell am I? <laughs> Why'd you cut him? Yeah, a lot of people got cut. I mean, I was really brutal with the cut. You know, if it didn't, if it didn't to help tell the story, I cut it. You know, so that's all part in like right, keeping, so it, keeping it tight. And so a lot of people got sixty left. or eighty. You know, friends of Mojo or you know, friends and family and acquaintances and business partners. They didn't get in. They all got filmed. Did yeah. You talk to one of the, when you talk about the Continental Club, a lot of those interviews. Uh, well, especially with Bullet Ed, the manager, and Wet Dog. A lot of those interviews are in the basement of the Continental Club while everybody's drunk upstairs. We're on the play in the Saturday party. So people were in a uh, more, uh, you know, loose manner when they did the interviews. Yeah. I think that's when Wet Dog explained the Don yes. Henley thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Wet Dog's, yeah. I mean, so people were a little drunk and we just got off stage and that kind of thing. So that, that turned out to be a great idea, you know, to get people in that moment so they're not like uptight in an interview set that you know set up um, that turned out to be a really good idea you know and then a lot of the interviews I did I did myself you know like I, I didn't have a crew you know and I think that helped to keep people at ease you know um, so it's just me and them and it just more felt like a conversation you know are you filming at all now are you doing anything for like putting this movie out any behind the scenes anything that we could see in the future um, you know, we're, I think we're going to do our last, I think it's probably going to show up in streaming like next South by Southwest, which will be the last Mojo Mayhem at South by Southwest. Um, so we might do a little thing about, you know, a little mini doc about that whole thing. Yeah, we might, we're going to try to get the Waco Brothers, the Beach Farmers, NRBQ, and the Yahoos, these are four of my favorite bands, to play uh, at the last uh, Mojo Mayhem. Uh, you know, it's a lot of old, old, old angry motherfuckers in my <laughs> But we're going to try to end it with a big blast and hand it over to somebody else. Let somebody else do it. Uh, all these old motherfuckers are starting to, you know, go away. Is there anyone you miss having around? Any one of those old fuckers that you just wish they were still around popping with you guys? Well, when we're, we're going to uh, we're going to go on the Outlaw Country West Cruise uh, here soon, and uh, me and John Doe and Dave Alvin and Country Dick Montana did this thing, the Pleasure Barons, mm -hmm. and we're going to recreate it on the cruise. And the one I miss is Country Dick. If Country Dick, well, well, here's what Bullet Ed says: If Country Dick was alive, Mojo would be dead, because uh, I would be, you know, I'd want to try to out drink and out drug him and everything, you know. And uh, but yes, if uh, it would be great if Country. Dick was alive, and when we did the Pleasure Barons on the on the cruise, uh, instead of it being a tribute to him, he was there. Mm -hmm. Country Dick was my, you know, I, I call him my D-mentor, my demented mentor, and the other one is Jim Dickinson, uh, the Memphis Madman, who produced a couple of my records, and, you know, it's, uh, I always felt like was telling me the secret history of rock and roll. He was, you know, he was trying, he was trying to pass on the, uh, you know, the subtext to the whole thing. I think I used that word right. No, you did. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's the Otis album that we're seeing with Jim. We, we all recording that when? Right. The yeah. movie opens with the uh, recording of the Otis album yeah, yeah. in Memphis with Dickinson producing. Yeah. yeah, Robert Gordon had filmed like a whole video uh, press kit, mm -hmm. and but he never used it. He And luckily, when he was cleaning out his shed, Hey, here's some mojo shit. I'll send it to I'll send it to fucking. Wow, Dad. the gym interview is just a find. Wow. Yeah, that's 2015. So that's I didn't even think I was ever going to have that wow. footage. So that showed up in 2015. Robert Gordon found all these tapes and sent them to me. So he owe him a big debt of gratitude. Yeah, we had like a two minute reel, but he had you know four hours of stuff he had wow. shot. Did got you know edited down. Is there a favorite look you've had over the years? Like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're probably wondering why. these are, these looks? Yeah, I think. You have a you're look? probably wondering about this here Amish beard. I lost a bet. 
I lost a, a NASCAR bet, and the, the loser has to go to the race in Charlotte at the Roval and show up with the Amish beard. So that's what's going on. I'm just trying to copy you, but I don't have the same that. Uh, what can we expect tonight? What's going to happen at this this show? Not the film. I don't, we care. I've seen the film. It's good. But I'm curious. Have you well, seen the live show before? No, not. Well, so, not here. Not at this location. Okay, I've seen yeah. it in Austin. But. Yeah, the live show is a little bit... Uh, it's a little, I don't know. Edgy. It's a little it's edgier edgy. than, edgy is a motherfucker. Than, than the records. So you'll expect something that's a little more over the top, probably. Do you, does it all just come to you, or are you thinking this shit no, before? I was writing down some ideas. I got a whole, there's a, a whole rant about the uh, Carolina-Kansas uh, basketball connection. You know, Dean Smith was born in Kansas, went to Kansas, and then went to Carolina. And then Roy Williams was born in North Carolina, came to Kansas and coached. Uh, but what, you know, and then they have the team here, the shot. Shockers. But what the uh, what the Shockers and Kansas and Carolina can all agree on is fuck Duke and fuck Kentucky. You know, so I'll have the crowd chanting fuck this. Yeah. So you know, I think of these things it's like the day of the show. I, I'll go through, you know, what you – and hopefully I'll find there'll be some local issue. Uh, usually I can find some local thing to talk about, and I'll, I'll you know, slip that in there in the in, within the, uh, you know, uh, ranch, raves, and, mon- and uh, monologues. What is serious meant to you as far as being a constant voice out there? What it's really meant is that, uh, I've never had a regular paycheck. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Every two weeks, money shows up in the bank. It's pretty much the only job he could have ever done. Yes, and they, they, invent, they invented it at the right time. Yes, uh, they're all right. They're, they're shocked. They, here's the most... They're shocked that I, I, there's a job I can do, and I've been doing it for 18 years. You would think some of the shit I said, I'd have been fired, you know. And there's been a couple of near misses, but I, you know, weaseled my way out, or you know, a lot of times people hear something and they hear, you know, worse than what it is, and then you play the tape back, and the boss will go, "Well, that's nothing." And I go, "Yeah, that's just somebody who's oversensitive, you know, look, looking to looking to run Mojo down." But yeah, no, it's been great working there. Uh, my my boss, Jeremy Tepper, is a great guy, and little Steven, you know, so I'm lucky they protect me. Uh, you know, uh, Stevie Van Zandt and Tepper, they, you know, they let me do what I do, and I don't get, you know, you know, occasionally they go, oh, tone it down a little bit, you know. Oh, here, I'm not supposed to say, <laughs> I'm not supposed to say, Patsy Klein so fine I'd suck her daddy's dick. So I stop, I stop saying that. I still occasionally say, yeah, Jordan, you just said it. Well, no, that, that, I'm talking about own series, and then, but, uh, but but I do occasionally still say George Jones sings so good, make your dick hard. Mojo Dixon, I love country. Say, I'm, I, you put cut the red light on, the monkey performs. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you listen to now? You know, I, I like I'm getting. To, I listen to all the kind of alt country acts, you know, that we play on Outlaw Country because that's part of my job. But, Do you uh, like all that? Uh, some of it, yeah. Some of you know, um, there, there's plenty. There's plenty for me to like. Uh, but if I'm in the car, I'm listening to uh, Bruce or the Replacements or the Pogues or the Clash. That's about it. <laughs> what does Mojo Nixon drive? I got a Ford Fusion, just a regular Ford, a red Ford Fusion. Shocking. I, yeah. He's never been a car guy. Yeah, I've always wanted a Volkswagen thing, uh, but I've never, you know, uh, it's never worked out. I almost had one a couple of times, right? You would think I would have a Volkswagen thing, you know, and um, you're running but, out of time. Yeah, I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to get a new Ford. I got to, yeah. Um, but I, yeah. And my son was like, you know, you know, well, what about, you know, you could get a German car or Japanese car. No. Nah. You know, I'm sure other people can. I'm sure, you know, it doesn't bother them at all. Uh, but I, I hold a grudge, and I'm, I'm getting an American car. We'd give you a lot of shit if you drove a German <laughs> car. Um, I, I like kind of asking you, what are you, what are you uh, watching on TV? What are you reading? What's Mojo doing these days? 
Uh, I just watched Mind Hunter on Netflix for like the third time. It's one of my it's David Fincher. It's one of my favorite things. It's about it's about the profiling of serial killers in the FBI unit. And in fact, BTK is from Wichita, which will be mentioned in the show tonight. And um, and I also just watched True Detective again. That first season of True Detective is unbelievable. But I went and rewatched season two. Uh, just it's not nearly as bad as I thought it was at the time. Uh, but it's still, it's a little too complicated. Season three is really good. And I just heard on the, on the, you know, the grapevine that season four of True Detective is going to take place in New Orleans and Jodie Foster is going to be in it. Um, so yeah, I like that kind of thing. I like, I like it dark, edgy, and psychotic. Uh, and also, I, I read a bunch of detective books, you know, kind of mysteries and I, everything that flows from Raymond Chandler. Mm. Uh, I, that's the, you know, kind of, I just finished a book at Hotel about a guy, uh, you know, who's a deputy down in Australia. Th things went haywire. Things went all flippity jibbing on him. I'm trying to remember, there was a, uh, there's a, a guy is a Japanese American guy who's written a series of books down that take place in Long Beach. Oh, what the hell is his name? Maybe like uh, and he also wrote a, a the reason I got onto him, he wrote kind of a modern version of Philip Marlowe, the Raymond Chandler detective. Wow. And um, but anyway, it's all good. I, uh, I'm something of a, if, if I read one and like it, I order them all, read them all. You know, you know, I'm a completist. I read until I get tired of them and then move on to the next guy, you know. What, I, I think his last name is spelled I-D-E, but it might be pronounced E-D or I-D. I, you know, I never, I never talked to him. There's a, uh, you know, there's, an, uh, there's another guy named Ace Atkins. Yeah. He lives in, uh, he writes these uh, kind of uh, you know, sheriff books in Mississippi. And he's also been writing the Robert Parker, uh, you know, Spencer books. Robert Parker died. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I read all those too. Yeah. The Travis McGee. All, all, and there's a whole series of kind of, you know, existential tough guy detective things. That's, you know, that's Mojo, in the Mojo wheelhouse. Mojo Noir hour needs yeah. to happen. Good God. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, Matt, is, is there a... Is there a, a concert, a moment that you always think of as like, that's the most kick-ass time we had with Mojo and, and with the Toad Lickers? Uh, I mean, I'd probably call it the, uh, the Liberty Lunch Show 1994 with Jell-O. So the one show we played with Jell-O. Um, is the one I remember probably the most. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, crazy pack sold out and just super crazy high. Oh, people were outside crying because Je Jello didn't play. The dead Kennedys were done. He didn't really play very much. So there was like a bunch of punk rockers outside. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. We had a bunch of them in the back. Yes, yeah, so it was both know? crowds and it was just kind of this crazy energy going on. Yeah, and so that, that's but it was also one of those songs, those Jello songs, uh, they're, you know, they're not the traditional, you know, Hank Williams and Chuck Berry chord changes. I had a fucking headache. I, I had a headache so bad I couldn't do drugs. That's how I'd been thinking so hard. Drugs had no effect on it. And then luck, luckily, Bill Davis had a, was, had a camera at the side of the stage. And so that's in the movie. Bill yeah. Davis and Dash River. So that's the scene we see. That's, that's, that's what you see in the best of the show I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, a little behind the scenes. Uh, that's the record version you hear in the audio. But since since it's the, we just made the album, it syncs up perfectly. Yeah, the, the sound was no good, so I was able to to sync it up, and it, and it's you know the, right. that's pretty damn flawless. I thought that was live. Yeah, the studio version is almost the same. I mean, it's like a it's like a rock and roll you know one take kind of version in the studio, so it just it lined up perfectly. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Um, Oh, well, let's keep going with fun food. What does Mojo Nixon like to eat? <laughs> We're just going to ask the random things. Yeah. Uh, barbecue and snacks. Mojo likes a lot of snacks. snacks. What's you your go-to snack? Me. I'm, a, I'm you there, too. Looking at me. No one's ever called me gutless. You know, right. Uh, you can tell by looking at me, I'm pro-eating. Yeah, so they are, you know, they on tour, I would uh, I would buy extra snacks and put them in the glove compartment in case, you know, because I had an attack. You know, it's a, a fainting spell or something. Yeah. I tried to, I had some heart problems it's called uh, uh, AC. You had heart problems? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I had a heart, but they fixed it. They did something called ablation. They fixed it. And I had to stop, you know, I was eating, oh, God, just awful stuff. This low salt diet. 
I, this is how I, when I was in the hospital, they were giving me the low salt food. And I think my wife had brought me like a burrito or something. And there was a, one of those little tear open things of salt and pepper. Anyway, it had fallen under the bed. I crawled, why, you know, after having, you know, near heart attack, crawled under the bed just to get a little salt. Just put a little salt on, on the food. This food tastes like cardboard. But yeah, but I'm all, I'm all better now. You got, you want to comment on the snacks? Uh, he likes beanie weenies. That's, that's the one. You know Beanie Weenies? Yeah. Yeah. yeah made by Van Camp. That's probably the snack I associate. Do you eat them cold or you heat them up? Well, I, I usually eat them cold. My dad ate them cold. I eat them cold. That's Pick, a man right there. Pickle and loaf. Wow. Oh, yeah. Pickle and pimento loaf. I, I was Those are the two things I'd probably associate most with yeah. his snacking. Yeah, pickle and pimento loaf is rapidly disappearing. Uh, you know, you re- you got to go down into the worst part of town to find the pickle and pimento loaf. And he leaves this stuff in my house when he stays in my house, so then I have to immediately throw it away. You don't eat it. The cats don't eat it. Your kids don't eat it. <laughs> um, would you want to do another tour? Like, would you guys want to go out in the thing, or do you like not having to be on tour like a crazy time? Well, we wouldn't do like thirty, you know, twenty shows, twenty-five shows in thirty days. But we might go out and play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You know, we fly in, play three cities, fly back. Uh, you know, especially if the movie has gained a little traction. So the the I hopefully. Mojo fans will see the movie once it's available, you know, on streaming or Amazon or Netflix. And they'll be, you know, and then they'll tell other nuts, hey, man, you got to see that Mojo movie. It's fucking great. You know, and and then there'll be, you know, a couple of club owners who say, hey, you know, you know, y'all, y'all want to come around? We'll do it. But we can't, we, we couldn't do five shows in a row. I'd be dead. Has Debbie Reynolds ever contacted you? Oh, Debbie Gibson? I mean, yeah, Gibson. I don't know what that is. <laughs> As Debbie Reynolds also contacted you. I think Debbie you. Gibson was, uh, she was okay with it, right? No. She wasn't okay with it. <laughs> well, no, De- I thought her record label was no, not. No, De- Debbie was okay with it. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Debbie. On, uh, I was working in radio in Cincinnati, and we interviewed her. And she was all fine. But she goes, my mother fucking hates you. <laughs> her mother is like a Long Island, uh, she sounds like a Long Island gangster. And she got her mother on the phone, and the mother's like, you know, you tried to read, my daughter's a virgin. <laughs> So yeah, dead. But uh, you know who I haven't, and, and also Don Henley got on stage and saying Don Henley must die. Martha Quinn, never. never. I did some stuff with the original VG, VJs from MTV. They're on Sirius. They're on like the 80s channel. Uh, Mark and those and those other guys and I, and they're all like, Martha Quinn hates you. You know, that, you know, uh, you know, she wasn't coming to this thing anyway, but she really wasn't coming because you were going to be because we did something together and something. Yeah. So I never talked to Martha Quinn. You know, wow. uh, stuffing Martha's muffin. <laughs> Showbiz. I think you and Debbie would have a cute kid. Yeah, it might look good. I yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, so to kind of wrap things up, I'm curious as far as y'all's relationship, knowing what he's been able to capture and do with all your stuff. Do you look at Matt any different? Matt, do you look at him any different? Now that you've seen so much footage and you've seen all, you've known the behind I mean, the I scenes. I didn't know the whole. I, I I didn't really know the whole story, even being in the band, and you know, so it was, it was the stuff I wasn't there for. So I knew I know more now. But uh, no, I mean, we knew each other so well before. I mean, I knew the whole thing before I even started, in a way, you know. So no, I mean, it, it hasn't changed much. I am shocked, shocked <laughs> that Earl Freedom, my bass player, made a good movie. I can't. Yeah, he didn't know. He didn't go to film school. He didn't go to film. Somehow, it's ex, it's exciting. It has a. It tells a story. It elicits people's emotions. It's unfucking believable. Uh, I couldn't have done it. I, I tell you that right now. I don't know if there's a better way to to stop it. I think that's the best selling point to the film. Gentlemen, I A, I love the film. It was amazing to see all the crazy shit you've been involved in. But thank you guys for bringing here, doing the concert. It, it's going to be a badass time. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.